Hi there and welcome to Plant CEO. In today's episode, I'd like to welcome Joey Pringle, the founder of Vision Factory. Hey Joey, how's it going? Hey buddy, it's good to be here. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you on the show. Um, yeah, it's going to be a really interesting one today because, um, you know, we're, we're changing the focus a little bit uh, on this episode, slightly away from food uh, and more about materials. Um, so do you want to tell me um, what Vision Factory is, first of all? So Vision is, um, we're part of the, the fashion industry. So um, we're an OEM manufacturer located in Guangzhou, China. And we, um, we specialize in making premium uh, vegan leather bags and accessories. So um, we're not a brand ourselves, but we, uh, we're a factory that produces for big labels in the industry and, uh, and brands all over the world, but in the most sustainable, transparent and ethical way. Yeah. And you've come from the, the fashion industry and uh, especially dealing with the topics of uh, sustainability. Do you want to tell me a little bit about your background story? So um, it's been a roller coaster, but um, it's been exciting. So originally from just North London here in the UK, and uh, I lived in Australia for two years. I was in Melbourne. I worked as a designer in Melbourne in between university. And then uh, after graduating university in uh, product design, I uh, couldn't get back to Australia. So I actually moved to Canada. Um, I had a fresh slate of visas. So on a bit of a whim after graduation, I moved to, I moved to Canada. And um, the first four years of my time in Canada, I was a carpenter. So I was completely outside of fashion. It was really a means to an end just to make money because Vancouver was an expensive city. And then after four years in Canada, um, I became a resident. And I said to myself, after becoming a resident, I wanted to get out of carpentry and kind of go back into, into design and product and fashion. And in Melbourne, I worked for a backpack company. So I wanted to kind of, kind of find that passion again. And I joined an incredible outdoors company at the time, very big company called MEC. And um, they gave me a contract and kind of got myself back into, into fashion. And then uh, my contract came to an end and I was very fortunate to slide straight into a small startup company company called Tentry. Um, they're very big now, but um, they gave me the opportunity as an accessories designer for them. And uh, quickly at my time at Tentry, I saw that there was huge potential to really kind of own something quite big and kind of take the, take the lead on this accessories category. So my role at Tentry um, spread quickly from design to development to sourcing to, um, to social compliance and kind of I wore many hats at this company and I tackled basically the, the entire category and part of my job at Tentry was responsible for the factories in Vietnam and, and China and I had about 10 to 12 factories that I was managing those relationships with and once a year I would travel to Asia to kind of see the factories, um, talk to them about what we're doing about the brand the brand was very sustainable um it was very um progressive and it was a tree planting company first and then it used fashion as a vehicle to plant trees and we tried to educate our factories in asia about what we were doing and we wanted to make sure that their their values were reflective on our values so it was actually on a trip in 2018 where i was in vietnam i was flying to guangzhou to meet um the factory that I'm going into business with. But at the time, this factory specialized in, in leather goods. And being a leather goods factory and being a sustainable brand, it was, um, it was like two kind of two values colliding together. It didn't make sense for a very sustainably conscious brand to be working with a, an owner who was very, you know what I mean, serious about the leather goods side of the world. And um, there's a few other red flags with this factory that we wanted to kind of see in person. So on my own, I flew from Vietnam to Guangzhou. Um, it's very close to being stuck in the airport in Vietnam and missing this flight. So <laughs> it's very serendipitous how this all happened. But um, I was able to get this flight to Guangzhou and um, I, was, I, I met this factory owner and I spoke to him about the leather goods, his business. And I wanted to understand a bit more about his values and. And to date in China, it was always very hard from a value standpoint to, to get Chinese factory owners to understand sustainability and understand the importance of ethical manufacturing and, and what brands wanted to see from their factories. But 
I talked to him about um, the concerns we had and the, um, he went on to explain that he's a converted Buddhist and being a converted Buddhist, um, he was like, I want to get away from the leather goods world and I, I want to start being more sustainable and, and have a factory model that's reflective of a healthier planet. And I was like, wow, this is, um, this is incredible to, to finally meet someone who's really taken the lead with his values and initiatives in China to kind of to restructure his factory. And he explained how he wants to start a green factory. And I was just like, wow, this is, um, this is amazing because obviously I was on this trip to go and speak to this factory to let them go. And um, I went completely full circle on myself. And I was like, wow, this is a, an impressive vision he has. And I said to him, I'd love to support you as a consultant and um, kind of help you out because I just loved what he stood for. And uh, we left it as that. I went back to, I went back to Canada for a year and um, I consulted for him on the side and uh, a year went by and the company I was working for, Tentry, they offered me a promotion. But at the same time, it got to a point in my life where I was like, do I want to continue working for someone else or do I want to do my own thing? And I've always wanted to kind of have my own business and do something big in my life that I can make the biggest impact as an individual. And this consulting um, factory position was kind of blossoming and there was something definitely big to happen here. So I said to myself, let's go back to China. Let's speak to this guy about what a full-time consultant would look like. Let's kind of weigh up these two options about full-time consultant or taking this promotion at my company and um, let's make a decision. So went back to China, end of 2019, um, proposed to this factory owner what a full-time consultant would look like. Um, basically the brands he would have to look to kind of um, working with the materials he needed to transition into and um, put it all on paper. And he looked at my plan and he was like, I don't need to be a consultant. I want you to be the owner of this factory. And I was like, that makes no sense because I never envisioned ownership like at, at, at this stage of our, of our relationship. And I never envisioned um, living in China full time because I don't speak the language and this guy doesn't speak English. I mean, this is all through translators. So it was a pretty crazy offer at the time, but we spoke about it more. And we talked about what realistically me look, was going to look like living in China and what the big picture was like. And I mean, the stars really did align. And um, I, just, uh, I, I couldn't turn this opportunity down. And it was something big for me to kind of, as an individual, as I said, have something big that I could celebrate and kind of change the industry in my in my walk of life. So I went back to Canada, I quit my job. Um, I became a citizen like a month later. So I've been there for eight years now and um, became a citizen. I left Canada for good a month after that and um, came back to the UK. I said to myself, let's take a time out here. Let's come back to the UK first and um, just take six months, see the family before rushing out to China. And then obviously the virus hit. Um, the whole world, as we all know, went into lockdown. And I said to myself, I mean, this is a crazy time and there's no better opportunity right now with kind of mother nature putting us all on hold to kind of reflect about our values and how us as businesses are, are um, operating. And the fashion industry was kind of, as we all know, has been suffering quite significantly in the last couple of years. And it does need to change quite quickly. So I said, hey, let's, let's launch this factory now. Let's get the storytelling going. Let's get the marketing going. Let's see if we can bring any new brands in. And what, we, what we'll do is we'll basically start this new factory out of this current factory. So in May, we launched the factory. Um, and then, yeah, we just took it from there. And it just, it's organically just snowballed out of control um, in a great way. It's been... It's been a crazy year, but um, here we are now talking to you. And um, yeah, 2021 looks pretty big for us. So it's been a, it's been a roller coaster. That's an amazing story. I think you you know just I think your stars must have aligned with your with your business partner there to make this all happen, right? It was a yeah. right moment for for you to consider that approach and that career change. And uh, yeah, it's amazing to hear that. Yeah, I mean, the universe works in, in crazy ways. And as I said, it doesn't speak English. I don't speak Chinese, but it's <laughs> without, um, there's a lot of magic happening. Yeah. 
story. Yeah. And, um, we're excited to see what we can do. So uh, in terms of the fashion industry, um, uh, especially you were saying, you know, for, for COVID, it's, they've been hit a lot, especially the high street retailers. Uh, there has been a lot of movement, obviously, for, for online and e-commerce, and that's been skyrocketing, especially with fast fashion. So that's been growing well. Um, why do you think the fashion industry, especially from a historical point of view, like the, the traditional firms, have been a bit slower to remove um, uh, animal skin from their from their ranges. Yeah, and I, I mean, I guess it, it's been slow because there hasn't been that demand and there hasn't been that momentum from the other side to push it. But now, as we can see with the vegan the vegan movement, um, that's really kind of created this move this energy and um, and it all started with food and our diets and now it's kind of that vegan um, lifestyle is kind of, is, is moving into how we, how we buy products. And now we're seeing a lot of momentum happening with that side of things. Um, there's a lot of incredible innovations going on. And to date, there wasn't really the, the reasoning to move away from leather because even though leather from an animal standpoint is, is a negative from a functionality standpoint and durability standpoint, it's an incredible material, but, for it to be able to move across to date, we've only had um, PUs and microfibers really as the as the options to kind of to go into a non-leather world. And for a lot of brands that specialize in, you know what I mean, animal leather products, they don't want to go from that functionality difference from, you know what I mean, a cowhide to PU because you're not getting the same characteristics. So now we're starting to see that innovation really take off in the last couple of years and we can touch on that in a bit more soon but that's the reason for why it's been slower but i, I see um huge potential in the industry changing um there's, a, there's obviously a massive shift in consciousness across the planet right now and the reason for me taking this leap to move to china to, to start this factory is that i'm a big believer that the industry is changing and i want to be there to support the brands who want to make that change because from what I've seen in the industry is that it's so hard to find a manufacturer that wants to go on that journey with you and um, kind of support you with making that change. I want to be there to support that leather movement transitioning into, into the vegan leather movement. Yeah. And um, so which, which brands would you say have already embraced this change? Um, from a from a, a big like a big brand name standpoint, I don't I can't name any particular like famous like kind of you know what I mean your, your top end luxury um, mm -hmm. brands that have made this change. But obviously, um, like Mushroom Leather is a great example of like companies like Adidas has obviously been always thinking about sustainability, and then um, Lululemon, these kind of companies like especially Lululemon traditionally hasn't been like pushing the innovation that hard. They have an, an innovation team and they do some stuff, but they're not driven by material innovation to, to see these kind of companies get access to like a mushroom lever for the first couple of years. There's yeah. some of the bigger names that are, say, oh, wow. I mean, the, these are some big names that are pushing for this space and investing in this space. So there are a couple of good examples. And um, we kind of we we really need to see these bigger companies set in the tone because there's a lot of smaller brands that have really got incredible voices that are not being recognised just yet. But for that big shift to happen, we need some of these big hitters. So the mushroom lever is a, is a great um, example of a way of bigger companies getting together, with like Stella McCartney and the Caring Group, and taking the, you know I mean this incredible material and saying, hey, this is what we're, where things are heading and kind of just, just disrupting the industry. So it's nice to yeah. see some of those happening. So do you, want, do you want to take me through the different type of material options there are and, and what you yeah. personally would regard in terms of, you know, quality and durability and, you know, um, touch uh, yeah. and all that, yeah. So, uh, yeah, as I said, I mean, to start from kind of the bottom up, um, from a vegan leather standpoint, you can start with your PUs and your microfibers and um, 
as I said, these are kind of the cheaper options. And today, there's been a lot of that out there. But from a sustainable standpoint, in the end of the day, it's just plastics. But yeah, and, it, and it's not biodegradable, right? So it will, no, there's, there's no circularity yeah. story there. There's a lot of um, harmful chemicals used in those materials. So it's an incredible material to get away from animal leather. But as I said, it's hard to kind of make that transition and that leap because from a characteristic standpoint, durability, quality, it's just not there. Um, so what's happening now is that we're seeing a lot of energy and investment going into like what are plant-based vegan leathers. Like mm. I get frustrated when I hear PU being branded as a vegan leather because yeah, yeah, totally. it's, yeah. it, it's not the right way to describe that material. Like I believe a vegan product should have coming from the earth, you know what I mean? Yeah. Totally. I agree with you. And it's, I, I feel like it's an easy way out for some of these companies and it's a cheaper option for them to use, obviously. For sure. And it's, it's a huge marketing grab. And I mean, I am vegan, so it, it, it is disappointing and it frustrates me. So what we're seeing now is like companies like Pinatex, um, they're an incredible option that, you know what I mean, derived from pineapple, the, the fibers, okay. incredible material. Um, Pinatex for us, we don't we don't use too much because the feel right now isn't like a luxury leather. It's more like a cardboard papery feel. Incredible material, but it's more so towards the fabric side of things rather than like a leather um, alternative. Right. Cost cost is very high. So again, to transition away from leather, you want to be able to match that cost and that quality. But Pinatex for us isn't doing the job. Um, what else is there? There's, there's apple levers. There's a lot of movement happening with, with that, which is like the byproduct of the skins from the, from the industry. And um, again, what they're doing there is they're mixing it with, with PU. So it is frustrating to see that the marketing being, oh, look, this is apple leather. And then these companies aren't following up by saying, hey, we need to shout loud and proud. We're using apples. This is an incredible innovation, but it's not right just yet. Like, no. let's take the time and let's, and let's stay true to ourselves. Um, there's an incredible company in Denmark called Beyond Leather. Um, they haven't kind of gone commercially live just yet, but I've built an incredible relationship with them. And um, is that also using Apple and the, the, the blended approach? They're doing the blended approach, but they're trying to, they're eliminating plastics from the rest of the composition. So they're looking into that kind of really circularity story where there's nothing harmful going into it. Okay. There's no plastics going into it. So they've stayed very patient in their innovations. Um, as I said, they're very transparent with me. I'm building some great relationships with them. And I'm excited to see what, what, what they bring out this year. And um, on top of that, there's grape levers. So again, similar kind of process. The grape lever, I haven't personally got my hands on it just yet. Um, a lot of these innovations are so small that they're very mindful about who kind of gets in, in touch with it first. And which is why like the mushroom lever, um, bowl threads, Milo out of California, They've got they've gone down that marketing route of giving it to Lululemon, Adidas, Stella McCartney to kind of launch it in the correct way. Um, so it's hard to kind of get your hands on some of these things, um, which leads me on to saying cactus leather has been our focus for the first year. Um, as I said, we specialise in luxury leather goods, and for our clients and our operation of our machinery, we need to make sure that the, that vegan leather that we're using is able to go through our machines and we can execute it at the, the same level as, as, um, as real leather. So with cactus leather, from a cost standpoint, it's a good cost. It's, um, it's actually a very, I can put some examples here. Um, oh, right. uh, yeah. so from a hand fill, from executing that, that quality, that luxury look. You it can, looks very, quite soft, yeah. It's so, soft, you know, when, when, when you when you said that it's going through the machinery, um, is it? Uh, that looks great as well. Yeah, um, when it's going through the machinery, that's obviously for a few things. One, c cutting the material, and then two, for the actual um, show it, sewing machine as well to make sure. It's yeah, like it. bending it. Like sometimes right. um, these, when you bend something, like the lever, it kind of it starts to fray in the middle. Like you right. see it break. Right. So with this, it like. As you see, like we can bend it to make this handle, we can right, paint, it. paint the edges. So we're nice. basically executing that same look. I mean, this is made out of cactus and, and PU, right. but 
it, it feels like leather. It feels luxury. The yeah. quality is good. There's a lot of testing around it. Um, I've been able to speak to the guys in Mexico and build a really good relationship with them. Um, and yeah, I mean, I put my focus on it because, I mean, as I said, PU and microfiber are something that we can work with, but I don't want to be pushing that because I don't believe in those materials. Um, there is recycled PU and water-based PU that we do use. They're better alternatives to those kind of bottom line. But Cactus for me has been what we've been pushing this year to, to all of our brands and our clients. And we've worked with some great brands already who have who picked up the Cactus um, and been able to kind of create this supply chain where it's worked with all of us to kind of make their productions happen. So it's, it's yeah. really exciting. But as I said, yeah. it's not the solution right now. From a circularity standpoint, biodegradable standpoint, it's not the answer, but it's on the path to being the correct answer. So we just got to keep pushing um, yeah, these yeah. guys to kind of make sure that they eliminate plastics from their materials, and we just keep keep going from there. Yeah, and I quite like it when when there's obviously these innovations that are coming out from um, you know uh, from waste. Uh, so whether it's leaves of a plant that uh, yeah. they've, I've used the fruit for, for example, yeah. uh, but I think that's awesome. Um, where where it's getting all all used again, you know, if it's been juiced as a drink. Yeah, one, I mean, as, it, it, there's no point just growing fields of cactuses for like just making leather out of. We need to be using it as a byproduct, and I mean, there's so much waste out there. And, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's all out there for investment and innovators. We just got to basically support that, support those brains. Yeah. And um, I think other than uh, the leather side, uh, you're also working um, with um, s some form of um, more fabric based as well. Yeah. Right. Uh, so you do you want to talk a little bit about that as well? Yeah, so we, we can do um, synthetics as well. So we basically were special, we, we focus on premium recycled nylons and recycled polyesters, um, eco nil, aquafil, they're an Italian yarn. Um, they make an incredible product that um, converts into an incredible nylon material. Um, so the brands to work with them, they have to get approval first. And then basically they'll tell us that they've got approval then we would order the fabric from them, from their mill. And then, yeah, we can convert that into just like your regular kind of backpacks, your, your suitcases, um, you know what I mean? Your laptop cases, these kind of things. Just where you'd see regular nylon being used. It's just a more premium nylon. So that's an incredible option. And then for polyester, we use a company called Reprieve. Um, they're a big American um, name. And they, again, have an incredible transparent story of recycled bottles being used to um, create a yarn and create some incredible fabrics and not just fabrics like webbings, meshes, all sorts of things out of recycled plastic bottles. Yeah. So typically, uh, you know, when you when you work with a brand, they would already have, you know, certain designs uh, in mind. Um, would there be this process where you would also help them with um, the design, especially you coming from that from that background yourself? Um, or is it like they, you know, you, you generally just here, here, here's the blueprint and just go ahead and make it. And yeah, I mean, tra tra traditionally for an OEM manufacturer, it's like give us the blueprint and then we'll make it. But I mean, I am a designer. My business partner is a developer, and then our director, she studied at Marangoni Design School in Milan, fashion. So we do have a lot of design um, backgrounds, and from a manufacturing standpoint. We want brands to work with us and lean on us for our for our design knowledge because when it comes to converting blueprint into into machine sometimes a designer's idea isn't i mean correct for from a production standpoint and it needs to work for production so to answer the question 80 percent is like we get the blueprint and um we'll go from there but if someone wants to lean on our expertise, we're, we're all here for that. I mean, it's nice to kind of give some ideas because it keeps keeps the uh, creative juices flowing. So yeah, um, yeah, totally. it's all situational, really. It depends yeah. on the experience of the designer and and the company and yeah, yeah. Whether, whether to support all that kind of stuff. So um, I'm not sure if you'd know this question, but who, which brand um, is the the biggest uh, user of the current sort of uh, leather, uh, you know, cowhide. 
um, you know, in terms of what they're making output wise? I mean, I, I mean, there's, there's loads. I couldn't, I couldn't name any big ones. I, I mean, the thing for me, which is really funny, is that my background isn't in leather goods. My background is in, in more synthetics. And the factory that I'm going into business with specializes in, in luxury leather goods. But that was just, a, it wasn't a coincidence, sorry. It was just, they could have done anything. The guy's values is what I was drawn to. He just so happened to have this business. And um, I'm quickly learning about that world. But since kind of getting into the leather goods world, I've focused more so on the vegan leathers. So I haven't done too much research into kind of, I mean, what's 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 the old stuff? I'm trying to think positively about moving forward. I mean, yeah. if you ask a business partner, she would be able to answer those questions. But. Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking that that would be the ideal um target list right to go after the ones that are already um producing so much that even even you know if if they are have a lot of output then to for them to create a division now or or a range to basically test the market for them and then you know if it's successful we hope they start to change i think that yeah um, i mean it it starts with consumer behavior first um once the consumer starts changing their attitudes a lot of these companies will start to um to keep up with the movement i mean that's the thing that's unfortunate is that you want these brands to be changing for the right reasons not changing to stay alive financially but i mean that's capitalism and we just need to make sure that we need to, we need to make sure that capitalism remains conscious moving forward rather than just like oh we're going to do a vegan range just for the sake of doing it because you know what I mean? That's not achieving yeah. anything. Yeah, we need we need more conscious capitalists. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so when your uh, your 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 business partner um, uh, is uh, is a converted Buddhist, you said. Yes. Um, yeah. Do you know what led him to to convert? Um, um, I mean, his business his business partner, who's our executive director, she's um. I think she turned Buddhist oh, maybe six or seven years ago. And um, I guess it's changed her life and her attitude. And basically she, she told him to kind of get on board this Buddhism train. And um, yeah, I mean, their values changed and they, they changed their diets and they changed their lifestyle and they became more conscious as individuals. They're very conscious people. And that's why I said, like, it is rare to meet someone in China from a factory ownership perspective that really does care about their workers and cares about the planet and and these types of things and they're challenging themselves as individuals so they got that they, they, they went down that path and then for me um yeah i mean i love those values because i'm, I'm very spiritual myself yeah and um so you also uh, practice meditation and what, what form of uh, meditation do you um, practice being quite spiritual so i practice it's called transcendental meditation right yeah i don't know if you're familiar with it i am yeah <laughs> not that i do it myself i, I meditate but I haven't, I haven't i haven't done that but i know there's lots of you know famous people obviously the yeah. big one there's sting and less known is probably jerry seinfeld but i yeah. know oprah yeah. the beatles used to be uh, in uh, yeah. yeah no there's some big hugh jackman some big names doing it yeah hugh jackman as well right um yeah. So yeah, do you want to tell me a little bit about that and what got what got you into uh, TM? Sure. So um, the, the 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 reason why I got into TM was um my brother took the course um about two years ago now. I knew he was meditating, and um, I mean at the time I didn't need to kind of get into it to, to, at the at that time of him doing it, and um, but. I kind of saw him change within six months. And I was like, oh, wow, like, this guy's becoming so calm and so like collected. And I was like, it's just way more happy. I was like, that's, that's interesting. And then, um, yeah, six months went across for him. And then for me, um, as I mentioned, at the end of 2019, I got to that milestone in my life, that crossroads where I was offered this incredible promotion in Canada. I was about to become a citizen. And I had this huge decision to make about this, this factory decision and to go back to China to make this decision. And I said to myself, I was getting to a point in my life where, um, I mean, yeah, we all experience stress, but I was probably experiencing too, too, too much that I should have. And 
I knew that if I was going to go down this this path of being chucking myself into the deep end, living in China in a country that I don't speak the language in, um, I needed to be in a position mentally where I was going to be like in full control, just like, you know what I mean? Be able to control it, my emotions, control um, the entrepreneurial um, mindset of jumping up a cliff and what's going to come with that. Because as we all know, it's, it's a tough road and I needed to basically be in that, in that best mindset and the best decision making possible. And I knew from what experience my brother had gone through at TN that it could be an incredible tool to access you know what i mean being kind of living in that in that in that pure consciousness so i took the course in november um and then yeah i mean as i said before that i was very spiritual before i've always believed in like the you know in the universe and 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 how things work and it's crazy you know i mean how my life has gone with this it's been so serendipitous but there's a reason for that. I think there's an energy out there. And then after finding meditation and having those kind of um, values before, it all just kind of, it all just made sense. And after more readings and practicing it and experiencing it firsthand, what's happening to me in my body and my mind, um, just a complete game changer really. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it all just comes down to um, just being at that high state of consciousness and once we get access to our subconscious, we basically find that pot of gold within ourselves. We find that inner peace and that happiness. And then we basically bring all that incredible energy and momentum into our conscious state. And then once we're living in this highest state in our conscious state, in our day-to-day -day lives, what happens from that is that we radiate that positive energy and veganism, um, sustainability, um, all these types of things that you know we're, we're talking about climate change or like all these different aspects they all come under that form of consciousness and I used to be a very kind of not a negative vegan activist but I was that kind of guy who is like putting stuff on my Instagram about like we need to change and you kind of really like you know you're fighting something that is a, is a lost cause because it's not the route to go down to, to make that positive change. And I've quickly learned now through meditation is that once you're at that higher state of consciousness, it's quite simple that if we, all we do is promote consciousness and get everyone to be at this higher state, everyone's decision-making will become better. And this is why it's very important for governments to start meditating because if governments can start meditating and get into that higher state, their decision-making becomes better. Whereas right now, a lot of the decision making in governments comes out of fear and we need to kind of get rid of that fear in our bodies in our societies and really kind of collaborate together on that higher wavelength and um when, when we get there and the vegan the vegan movement is a, an incredible example of once we all get to that state of mind um what happens naturally from that is nothing but positivity and i mean outside of the, the vegan food if you go into a vegan restaurant you'll see that everything's fought out they're conscious with the packaging that's being used they're conscious with you know i mean that the way the building is has been built and the ownership and it just that radiates just so much positivity so basically it's just getting to that higher state and once we're all there as a human race we'll start taking down the divisions of like race and countries and you're from here and you're black and you're white and we'll start loving each other more and it will be a happier place so there we go it's a very very beautiful thing that you just yeah. said that it's amazing so i mean yeah it means it's been an absolute game changer for me and um i want to implement that into the business it is part of our values now and um i like to get the factory meditating i want to get my business partners learning transcendent tm and yeah. um, what happens is once in a business, if you all start meditating together, you will just radiate that, that, you know what I mean? Those positive feelings around the company. And then if people are happier in their work, I mean, people are happier and res better results happen. And I mean, it's, it's quite simple really. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you had a, a nice analogy uh, where you described to me uh, earlier around the sea. Um, do you want to just say that again? Yeah, like so for people quiet. that don't know what transcendental meditation is, is um, there's many forms of meditation. Um, the best way to explain 
TM is that it is one of the deepest forms of meditation and that's because you're accessing your subconscious. So if you take the analogy of the ocean or a body of water, um, regardless of if there's a storm on the surface of the water, so say the surface of the water is our mind, like up here, some days we're angry, some days we're having a crap day, some days we're happy, sometimes we're calm. Imagine that's the same with the sea and the ocean. Some days it's choppy, some days it's smooth sailing, some days it's, you know, there's a few waves going on. Um, but at the bottom of the ocean is always stillness. It's, you know what I mean? There's no thunderstorms at the bottom of the ocean, there's no choppings at the bottom of the ocean. It's very calm, it's very still. So imagine your subconscious is like the ocean. So at the bottom of our subconscious, it's always still, it's always at peace, it's always tranquil. Whereas at the top, we need to calm down this, this, what's happening up here. So in regular meditation, all we're doing is calming the surface level. Whereas in TM, you're getting access to dive to the bottom of the ocean to find that place of calmness that's in, that's in within all of us. And then at that place is where all the good stuff is. That's where all the joy and happiness is and the positivity. And also once you get to that subconscious state, um, you start to find that inner peace and you start to find that calmness and that enlightenment. And what you simply do is you just bring all that back up to the surface. Um, you've one, you've calmed the mind. And then two, you're bringing all that good energy back up. You're removing all the stress, all the anxieties. And in your day-to-day -day life, you just start living in that more kind of enlightened conscious state. So um, it's a powerful, powerful tool. It is quite simple. Um, you have to learn it. You can't just go and read a book about it. Um, I took a course on it. And um, yeah, I mean, looking back, I wish I took the course way earlier in my life. People say, why do you have to pay to meditate? But it's no different to paying to go to a gym or paying to play football or paying to eat healthy. Like the mind is and the brain is such a powerful tool that we need to put some investment into it. And it's a one-off investment and um, it's an absolute game changer. And I mean, you see all these actors and actresses doing it and there's a reason for that because, yeah, I mean, it just, it's, a, it's an incredible, incredible, powerful tool. Yeah. And the, the process is that you would, to get into that, that state, you would uh, say a mantra. And the mantra is basically yeah. uh, based on the, the ancient Indian language, which is Sanskrit. That's correct, uh, yeah. And um, by the way, my, my, uh, there are some schools that actually obviously uh, teach uh, Sanskrit. And actually my daughter is actually learning Sanskrit. So maybe I should speak to her about it. But, um, and, and the TM teacher would basically give you uh, a, a word, a mantra to say in Sanskrit that you repeat. Is that what you do uh, in your yes, when you do your mantra? Yeah. yeah. So you basically, you're See, you're your already Ill illuminated now <laughs> in this oh, current no, state. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> is it too bright? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, yeah. You, you get that mantra on your course, and then. It's something that you don't speak about ever. It's something that's just in your head. So when you, you close your eyes and you start to meditate, you just get that mantra. Then that mantra basically is the tool for you to transcend into your subconscious. Whereas a lot of other meditations, I get you to stay on that surface level. I mean, they're great. It's always always incredible to, to calm the mind, but you want to get deep down within. And yeah. it's basically understanding your soul and understanding the soul is separate from the body. And um yeah, I mean, this is just a vehicle that the soul operates. That's right. That's right. Um, there, there is other ways, like you, you can basically do this other method, which is more vision based, where you mm -hmm. you try and get to a stage of innocence, yeah. uh, where you you know you're you're sort of um, you know like a baby in a way. So you're, you're very yeah. young uh, and. Uh, uh, and, and in that way, you don't you don't know anything about the world, and 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 then you don't make any judgments when you're in that space. There, there, there's another te so I learned this technique before actually. Um, so maybe another time we could talk about it. So um, yeah, there's 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 different ways to get there. I think, and, uh, and yeah, there's, think there's there's multiple ways to transcend. With yeah. TM, we just said that the um, the mantra is the is the easiest way. You can look at something for a period of time. That's what Buddhists do. They look at like a an like a photo, like a, a piece of art, 
and then basically that will turn into just a nothing which gives them that vehicle to transcend but with tm like it is so easy and for people that have like adhd and I find it hard to sit still. Like I used to be that guy where I fidget a lot and I was like the four, the idea of sitting still for 20 minutes, I was just like, wow, I was taken back and it's fun. And from a creative standpoint, from like um, the creative industry, all your best ideas, all that creative juices, all the best stuff comes when you meditate. So for me now, if there's a huge decision to make, sometimes you're like stressing about how do I make this decision in and like, well, how do I do it? When you meditate, it's just like you just start, you just let everything go, and then yeah, you get that the, the answers come to you in meditation, and you come out, and you just like you you, you act on those answers, and yeah, yeah. you act on it in in your conscious state. Totally. Do you, do you know what um, did um, Steve Jobs used to do any form of TM? Or I know he's done some some teachings around. No, I'm, not, I'm not sure what Steve Jobs. He was very spiritual himself. Um, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. It's very, it's very big in like in in these corporate worlds now, and yeah, yeah, from a level standpoint. Yeah, I mean, if you want to be that leader. Yeah, if you want to be that that leader, you need to be able to just, you know, what I mean, be that calm, collected person, and have that ability to just, you know, what I mean, don't get caught up on small things and to basically let things go over your head and just keep being the best leader you can. Yeah. Fantastic. And um, yeah, just thinking about Steve Jobs um, and Apple, um, you know, yeah. they've made a, a really big sustainability drive um, with, with their products, you know, uh, like the iPhone 12, you know, they've removed the charger to eliminate, you know, electrical waste and smaller packaging. Uh, but on the other side, they're still selling uh, leather good accessories with, with Hermes and, and they've developed their own range of uh, card holders on the back of their phone. I saw that, yeah. Um, so I'm a bit disappointed even being, you know, I'm, an, I'm a loyal Apple user. Um, sure. But when, when it comes to big companies still using leather and not thinking about sustainability also yeah. to do with, you know, animals and, and, and you know, we shouldn't be yeah. Using their skin as as a product, it just doesn't make any sense in this day and yeah, age. It's, it's it's frustrating. Um, I mean, it's sim just simply put, it is as a, kind of following up from being at that higher state of consciousness. Again, a lot of these businesses, it starts from the top the top down, and you just need to be aware of everything. And it's, it's all good being sustainable in, in one aspect, but like if you're not following it up in something else, it's like like what are you doing but again it, it's just a, it's a learning curve as big and as established as apple are they're obviously from a, a high up perspective it's such a simple change and a simple thing to think about but when you're not acting at that higher state of consciousness they obviously think that was a good thing and i mean i mean it's a no-brainer now to like be able to make that shift but again it's about taking the time to do that research and look and obviously they missed it and it is a little frustrating because we talked about those bigger companies setting the tone but again i mean it's all from the, the, the top down and yeah. the, the so the top it, it's not too late for them right they can they can oh, easily switch, switch out the material and i've written to tim cook about it already yeah get, get tim in touch and we can we can make apple cactus leather apple products for them so that's an easy it's an easy shift and it these kind of things now these do, these can shift overnight because before it was challenging but now it's it is it is quite easy and it is it is, it is a daunting space sourcing sustainably like i've been there as a designer and it is hard and it is overwhelming and not every aspect of your business is going to be sustainable like we are I own a factory now in china and there's lots of things that we need to improve on but am i going to like quit now no like we're gonna keep doing it and there's gonna be stepping stones and i always say rome wasn't built in a day and it takes time to, you know what i mean but providing your your operating in that highest state of consciousness and you're being that leader and you'll keep pushing yourself like you're gonna kind of you, you're always gonna get to that, that that state if you keep pushing your business to be more sustainable so with apple 
hopefully they can just keep pushing themselves. They've obviously done a really good thing with their batteries. And the next step is to make everything reflective of that. So it just takes time. Yeah. So um, how's the, the best, what's the best way that people can get in touch with you? You know, if there's uh, companies, brands watching this that, uh, you know, want to take the plunge and, you know, yeah. look at changing their, 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 their existing ranges or if they're startups even, you know, we know some startups together, don't we? So we know uh, Damoy and Jamie and they've created uh, Hakua yeah. now with their brand. So uh, even if there's a small startup, what's the best way to, to get in touch with you? Um, so, I mean, if you're following along still and you're still here, I appreciate um, <laughs> hearing, hearing us out. Um, the best way to get in touch with me right now, I'd say probably LinkedIn is a great, great place to just say, hey, and tell me what you're doing. And then the website right now, um, vishinfactory.com, you, you can place a submission on the site and basically let me know the kind of product we want to get made and your moqs and these types of things and then also instagram is um what we're using as our tool for kind of providing that radical transparency um in china and um if you want to give us a follow on instagram i'm pretty active on on instagram to kind of connect people so i'd say linkedin's the best way to um just approach me directly right now but in time we're working on a new website and um, that would be the best tool in the future to kind of just go through the website and kind of send us a note about what you're doing. But yeah, please get in touch. Um, bigger brands, ideally, right, right now, um, with smaller companies, because we are manufacturing a manufacturer in China, um, our MOQs are higher. So it is more challenging for a startup because from that MOQ standpoint, it is, um, there's a, it's very technical. This, I mean, the supply chain it is very. It's it's a big thing getting something made overseas and going through those those um, those obstacles like having a freight forwarder and understanding tariffs and shipping and sending material from Mexico to China. So, if you're a startup, for sure get in touch. But the um, it's um, it's a it's a challenge. But we we can support if it's the right fit. But, um, bigger companies for sure right now that would love to start. We work with a lot of big leather goods companies that we're converting across, but I'd love to start working with some bigger companies that are wanting to really push that vegan leather message off the bat. Yeah. Do, do you have a wish list that you would, you know, is there certain brands that you would love to work with? Um, uh, yes and no. I, I mean, there's a company called Everlane, in, they're in California. I mean, uh, and Reformation. The Reformation doesn't, doesn't make bags just yet, but Everlane does. But um, they're a great company that really kind of share my values. Um, they do a lot of stuff with transparency of their manufacturers, and they're a company that I'd love to work with eventually. Um, as I said, we specialize in the luxury leather goods world. So um, we'd love to just see some of these, um, these kind of private labels kind of made that conscious decision to start becoming vegan and we basically can be that be that person for them and one thing i want to mention is that a lot of these companies have agents and middlemen on the ground in china with factories and to date that kind of middleman agent um culture it's been it's been hard to trust and um the reason for me relocating to china is that I want to give people that peace of mind that, hey, there's this like British Canadian guy who just lives in China now who owns a factory and it's me owning the factory. I can give that transparency. Whereas with an agent, they can't give you that transparency because they're just the middle person. So I'm trying to cut out that person, which is going to cut out some costs. Um, if you're an agent, listen to this. Like as long as you're a good agent, you're going to be fine. But you need to make sure that... Um, you're supporting and you're really pushing that transparency and you're pushing factories to become more transparent rather than just getting orders and placing it. We really want agents to really be pushing factories and factory owners. And that's what I wasn't seeing. I've worked with a couple in my time and um, it's been frustrating as a designer working in China. So I just thought, hey, we should start a factory instead and I'll just be that guy on the other side to give people peace of mind and to help them out. So there we go. Great, so perfect. Um, I wish you the best of luck uh, with your journey now, uh, doing that. And uh, 
yeah, hopefully we'll get to see some some products, uh, you know, coming out from your factory a lot more. And yeah, I'll, I'll be know. posting and celebrating um, our clients. I want to try and remove the fear and the barriers of kind of the competitive nature of the industry. I understand people need to stay secretive to some point, and um, you know what I mean. You don't want to like burn too many bridges, but I want to celebrate the collaboration of the vegan brands and how. Nice. They shouldn't be competing with each other. And they should be yeah, competing. Yeah, that's important. Rather than right. like retailers are saying, hey, we've got one space for like a vegan product. They need to be having three brands in those retailers. You know what I mean? They need to be opening up that space and kind of ditching the unsustainable companies. So I want, so, we want, want to be promoting that and getting the brand leaders who I'm working with, the owners to be, hey, that's a great idea. It's about empowering each other at the end of the day and working to working together to create this change right totally so thank you so much joey uh, Thanks, for coming on the show it's been been great uh, all the stuff that we've spoken about and uh yeah hopefully see you again soon okay thanks man take it easy see you bye yeah bye <laughs>